chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, and this is the um, last lecture on full preterism. <clears throat> Number 13, I believe. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, eagerly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are on, in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. <clears throat> now of all the passages thus far that we've looked at at the resurrection, and we've basically surveyed almost all of them in the whole Bible, there's general agreement as to their meaning by scholars, commentators, and writers within Christendom. So we're not talking about full preterists because we don't consider them part of Christendom. Full preterism is a cult. Let me just fix this page here. But this passage before us right now is a difficult passage which has engendered much disagreement as to its meaning. And there are essentially two different views among Orthodox commentators. One view is that this passage has absolutely nothing do with the resurrection of the body, but is speaking of heaven itself, or a building or dwelling place in heaven. And that would be the uh, opinion of uh, Ephraim, Hervius, Aquinas, Hodge, and Tasker, for example, and of many others. The other view, which is the majority view, and I think definitely the preferable view, the correct view, is that Paul is speaking about the reception of a new glorified body at the parousia of the second coming of Christ. The latter view makes the most sense and should be embraced. And we will briefly examine this passage while exposing the manner in which full preterists have misused it. <clears throat> now this section of scripture is part of an encouragement that Paul begins back in 4.14. After discussing the great hardships and sufferings of the apostles and evangelists in their ministry, the apostle discusses why he is not discouraged and why we also should have hope. And he begins with an explicit statement on the resurrection. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus Christ will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. And then he follows this with a number of reasons why the struggles of life are worth it. Okay, and why they will not last forever. Now Paul's introductory phrase, for we know, indicates that what the Apostle is about to say is common knowledge among believers. Because it has already been given to them by inspired apostolic instruction. Okay, this is not a new teaching, this is something that Paul had instructed them in, and so he says, for we know. Paul had given detailed instructions regarding the resurrection to this church specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 13 to 14, and 15, 2 to 58, the great resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians. And he had written about this issue in his uh, first written epistle, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, which had already, of course, been widely circulated among the churches by the time 2 Corinthians was written. And interestingly, uh, 1 Thessalonians was probably written during Paul's stay in Corinth in A.D. 50 or 51. So it's quite possible that the Corinthians had heard 1 Thessalonians before the Thessalonians did. So they had been instructed about the resurrection. He says, if our earthly house, this then is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <coughs> now Paul first emphasizes the fragile in permanence and perishability of our human bodies. Our bodies are tent-like in their frailty and uh, removableness. Okay, you know somebody, then the next day they get hit by a car, they're gone. They're mortal, they're easily killed. 
They are destroyed or dissolved because they decay into the earth. Our bodily existence on this earth is like living in a tent which may be taken down at any time. <clears throat> our bodies are called earthly because they live on this world are connected to and dependent upon this earth. Although as believers, obviously we are citizens of heaven, we are only sojourners in this present world. Now the use of tent to describe the human body as perishable is not without precedent. Peter spoke of living in his tent, that is his body, which must be put off soon. 2 Peter 1, 13-14. In 1 John 1, 14, <coughs> excuse me, in John 1, 14, indeed the tent metaphor is used of our Lord's incarnation and earthly sojourn. The word became flesh and literally in Greek, pitched his tent among us. The English version says dwelt among us, but the, word, the Greek word literally means pitched his tent among us. After our tent dwelling, the physical body is taken down by death. We have a house, oike domen, domen, from God not made with hands eternal in the heavens. <clears throat> now this section of verse 1 is difficult and has been the source of much misunderstanding. The full preterist will point out that Paul uses the present tense, we have, echo men, and will argue that Christians who die after AD 70 receive their resurrected bodies at death. And there are three serious problems with such an interpretation. First, the present tense in the Greek language, Koine Greek, is often used of a future which is absolutely certain. <coughs> now I debated a full preterist not oh, a couple months back and, and uh, he very effectively used the present tense argument against me and I think he knew full well that the present tense could refer to a future but uh, he was uh, equivocating. <coughs> New Testament writers frequently pen the present tense with a future meaning that is determined by the context. One example for, uh, is the Gethsemane narrative, which prior to his arrest, Jesus says, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners, Matthew 26.45. Just as Jesus knew the nearness of his betrayal, so Paul knew with certainty that a heavenly home was waiting for him. In fact, the Greek scholar A.T. Robertson regards the verb used here as a futuristic present that expresses Paul's co confidence. A.T. Robertson is one of the greatest of Greek scholars. <clears throat> now, full preterists, either out of ignorance or with some out of dishonesty, capitalize on most Christians' ignorance of Greek grammar in order to trick people into accepting their system. And we've noted this before. When they talk about... Uh, the meaning of certain words, and they ignore the fact that they do not have to teach eminence in all cases. Second, <coughs> the manner in which full preterist approaches this passage reveals how they often violate fundamental rules of exegesis. The whole New Testament consistently and repeatedly teaches that the resurrection of the body occurs at the second coming of Christ on the last day. And Paul taught this throughout his career, both before and after this epistle was written. Uh, before 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 15, and 1 Corinthians 6, and after this epistle, uh, Romans chapter 8, Philippians 3, 2 Timothy 2, 18. The last epistle that Paul wrote. They all teach the unity of the eschatological complex. The day Jesus Christ returns is the day of resurrection, the day of final judgment, the day the eternal state begins. Also the day of the rapture. Full preterist methods of interpretation where several clear verses are twisted and forced into a paradigm have more in common with a cult methodology than historic Protestant hermeneutics. The clear must be used to interpret the less clear. Scripture must be compared with Scripture. Scripture cannot contradict itself. If there is a valid, sensible interpretation of this passage that is in harmony with the rest of Scripture, we should accept it. Third, if one accepts the full preterist present tense argument, which of course they use in other sections of scripture as well, then one has not only refuted the historic confessional orthodox concept of the resurrection, but the full preterist view as well. 
Full Preterists teach that the general resurrection of the dead occurred in A.D. 70. Okay, they, that's when they believe Christ returned. Literally. <clears throat> but, if we accept, accept the present tense reasoning, then we would have to acknowledge that resurrections were occurring in A.D. 52, when 2 Corinthians was written. This interpretation would mean that resurrections of the dead saints have always been progressive, both before and after A.D. 70. See what they do. They take 2 Corinthians here, and they try to say, well, see, this proves that the moment you die, you get a new resurrected body from heaven. But you can't do that, and, and also hold to the present tense argument, because then resurrections would be occurring prior to the second coming of Christ, which contradicts Scripture explicitly. If they were consistent in their reasoning, full preterists would argue that both the historic understanding of the resurrection as well as the full preterist view were erroneous. Now, Paul, in this and the following verses tells us a number of things about the house that will clothe us in the resurrection. First, it comes from God, and it is not made with human hands. Now this observation, of course, does not mean does not mean <clears throat> that our original bodies were made with human hands. Great, I'm missing a page. Second. Hmm. Full Preterist interpretation is refuted by Paul's description of what takes place. <clears throat> he talks about being clothed with our habitation from heaven. Verse 2. Or further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Verse 4. The verb used refers to putting one garment on over another. Does this new garment simply cover over the disembodied spirit of man, as the full preterist asserts? No. Paul says, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Verse 3. He says that he wants to be further clothed so that he does not have to be unclothed, verse 4. So his whole point is not, I want to die and get rid of my body so I can receive a spiritual shell to house my spirit. But I want to put on my new glorified body so that I will not have to experience death at all. That's his point. <clears throat> The Apostle desired to be alive when Christ returns so that his present body could be further clothed by his new glorified body. Now, if the full preterist view that we receive new, completely new resurrected bodies at death that have no relation to our physical bodies that are allowed to decay forever was true, then Paul would not have dreaded the idea of being naked and that it's a soul without a body. See, Paul has a Hebraistic view of death where having your soul separated from your body is unnatural and viewed, and viewed as bad. <clears throat> Paul longed for an instantaneous change, 1 Corinthians 15.51, and transformation, Philippians 3.21. He wanted to be like Enoch, Genesis 5.24 and Hebrews 11.5, and Elijah, 2 Kings 2.11, who were taken bodily to heaven and glorified without experiencing physical death. Because of his biblical worldview, Paul had a very negative concept of death. He recognized that death was a consequence of sin, and that the separation of the soul from the body was unnatural. The soul and body of man were created by God to be together. Okay, the Bible does not have a Neoplatonic or Gnostic view of the body. The full preterist does, apparently. God is not a Neoplatonist or a Gnostic. He created us as beings with two separate aspects that were meant to be together forever if sin had not entered the picture. 
Consequently, Paul regards the soul without the body as naked. He looked at death as something repugnant because of this separation. Therefore, Paul wants his glorified heavenly body to cover his present earthly body like we put on an overcoat over our clothes. The picture conveyed is that of the heavenly body being put on like an outer vesture over the earthly body, with which the apostle is, as it were, clad so as not, so as not only to cover it over, but also to absorb and transfigure it. Okay, remember the Greek word is the one of putting like an overcoat over what you're wearing. That's what the Greek word means. In this way, both of, we have both continuity and transformation, which also is prominent in the great resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. Indeed, the very same metaphor is employed in the earlier epistle where it said that corruption must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. We don't have replacement. We have transformation. By the way, if you have any doubt about the correct meaning of ependusithi, let me just read here from Philip Hughes. The prefix epi signifies the putting of an additional outer garment. We cannot agree with Tasker Hodge and others that Paul is using the compound in simple forms indiscriminately as synonyms. On the contrary, that a precise distinct meaning is intended is confirmed by the terminology of verse 4, where he says that it is, it is not that he wishes to put off a garment, that is his present earthly body, but to put on over another garment, that is the glorified body will be, which will be provided at Christ's parousia. The usage of the same compound verb in Herodotus, Josephus, Plutarch establishes yet further that it bears this specific sense. To this evidence may be added that of the cognate noun, and he has a couple Greek verbs, and he a number, a cites a number of Greek uh, ancient authors, which are used to signify the, the putting on of an outer garment. Your body, whether it's alive or dead, will be transformed. Paul's use of the metaphors in verse, verses 2 through 4 indicates that he still may have a concern about certain proto-gnostics that he had to deal with in his previous epistle. These men denied a future bodily resurrection, likely in favor of a disembodied or purely spiritual immortality. Consequently, Paul asserts, we do not desire to be unclothed, but, in the word, Greek word literally, overclothed with our heavenly immortal bodies. Now to anyone who had been under the influence of Greek philosophy, <clears throat> they would look forward to a non-bodily existence. They viewed the body as inferior. Paul says, we will not be found naked. This passage is perfectly suited to refute the full preterist concepts of the resurrection. The apostle makes it crystal clear that our present physical bodies are incorporated into our spiritual glorified bodies so that although they are radically different, they are still the same bodies. Okay, that's the teaching of this passage in Corinthians. <clears throat> Now, the people who disagree with that interpretation uh, think that Paul is just talking about a building up in heaven, and they say that the parallel is John 14. <clears throat> well, we've seen that does not fit with the Greek. It does not fit with what Paul actually says. Let's look at Philippians 3, 20 to 21. <clears throat> for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. In these verses, Paul makes a statement regarding the position and expectation of believers as an antidote to the wicked behavior and unholy attitude of the church's enemies. Do you want to look at the previous passages of verses 18 to 19? 
There had been infighting in this church. The apostle wants them to have unity and follow his example. The Philippians need to focus on their citizenship in heaven. Now, Philippi was a, made a Roman outpost in 42 B.C. It was governed as if it was on Italian soil. And the inhabitants of the city were proud of it. They were proud of their Roman citizenship. So Paul brings up this issue of heavenly citizenship. They need to keep in their mind that ultimately they belong to a heavenly commonwealth. Consequently, their attitude, behavior, and priorities in life should reflect this heavenly rule. They also need to look to their glorious salvation that will take place at Christ's coming from heaven. They are to eagerly await... Excuse me, they are to await eagerly. They are to have an urgent anticipation of the Redeemer's eschatological victory. So Christians eagerly await the revealing of the sons of God, Romans 8.19, their sonship. Here described as the redemption of the body, Romans 8.23, the future hope, Romans 8.25, the hope of righteousness, Galatians 5.5. The revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.7, and the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, Philippians 3.20. Now, what is particularly interesting and important for our discussion of the resurrection is Paul's description of what takes place when Jesus returns. The verse literally reads in Greek, The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humiliation, for it to be conformed to the body of His glory. Well, there are a number of things we need to examine in this verse. First, what does Paul mean by our lowly body or the body of our humiliation? Well, when Scripture discusses the body of our humiliation, it is not discussing the body as intrinsically evil, but what the body has become as a result of sin and the fall. Because of the sin, our bodies are weak, subject to disease, dishonor, death, and physical decay. Our bodies are mortal and perishable. Romans 8, 11, 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44. As such, they are not fit or ready to inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. As Paul has noted before, they must be changed, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, before they are ready for eternity with Christ. This moral must put on immortality, 1 Corinthians 15, 53. the body of your humiliation. Go to the old folks' home and look at those people who are 80 and 90 years old. You get old, you get weak, your body falls apart, and then you rot. Second, what is meant by the word transform? Well, the word here, metashematizo, uses a compound verb consisting of meta, which carries the idea of change or transfer, and schema, which means appearance or form. The compound means to change in fashion or appearance. Thayer says this, to change the figure of, to transform. Now given this, trans, this definition, the best English translation is probably transform, the New King James and the NASV. The words change, King James or RSV, and fashion anew, however, are certainly adequate. What is important for our study is that Paul's description of the glorification of our physical moral body involves a change, refashioning, or transforming of what is already there. Now this description is an explicit contradiction of the full preterist conception of the resurrection. The full preterist teaches that your body, the body of your humiliation is never transformed, it's never changed, it's discarded, it's left to rot as garbage. It is left in the grave forever and is replaced by something completely new and completely different. Third, Paul says that our bodies are transformed in order to be conformed to, the, to Christ's glorious body. The result of this transformation also supports the orthodox traditional concept of our glorification. Our physical bodies under, will undergo a change that makes them like our Lord's resurrected glorified body. This supports Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 15.49 that as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. 
it also concurs with John who wrote in 1 John 3, 2, we know that when he is revealed we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our bodies will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, 1 Corinthians 15, 51-52. Paul is not describing sanctification here, but the miraculous instantaneous transformation that takes place at the parousia. He's talking about your glorification. Your glorification. Our Lord's resurrected body is the prototype and the paradigm of His people's glorified bodies. Our bodies, which are weak, frail, and liable to sickness, suffering, death, and decay, will be made spiritual, and perishable, glorious, powerful, and perfect. As Robert Johnson eloquently asserts, yet how different the whole man will be. How gloriously different. The body sown in corruption shall be raised in incorruption, free from pain and disease, from decay and mortality. The eyes of Jacob shall no more be dim for age. Mishbosheth shall not be lame in his feet, nor shall the senses of Bazalel be dull and languid. For like age and infirmity are unknown to the children of the resurrection. So to the dishonor of uncomeliness it shall be raised in the glory of perfect and unending beauty, fashioned like unto the body of Christ's glory. So in weakness it shall be raised in power, power to serve the Lord unwearingly day and night in his temple and to bear the exceedingly eternal weight of glory. So in a natural body, a body fitted for the use of the earth, uses of the earth, it shall be raised a spiritual body, a dwelling suited in everything for the holy and happy spirit, an instrument exquisitely adapted for prosecuting the pursuits of heaven and ministering to its pure and exalted joys. End of quote. <clears throat> Fourth. The transformation of our body of a humiliation is in accordance with our Lord's power that subdues all things to himself, verse 21b. <clears throat> like a number of other of Paul's resurrection passages, the glorification of believers' mortal bodies is placed in connection with the Savior's subjecting of everything under his kingship. Christ is able not only to transform the body, but also to subject it to subject the entire universe to himself. Indeed, one may state that Christ's transformation of man into his own image, Romans 8, 29, is an integral part of a subjection of the entire universe to his own person. Thus, once again, we see that the, by redefining the resurrection of the body passages and placing the second coming of Christ in A.D. 70, the full preterist is forced to redefine and greatly limit the victory of the cross and the empty tomb. <clears throat> now, if somebody came to you and said, well, I deny the resurrection of the body, well, you'd say to them, well, you're a heretic. But the full preterist, they deny the resurrection of the body by redefinition. So they are also heretics. <clears throat> the physical part of Christians is never redeemed in the full preterist system, and the planet Earth is never purged of the effects of sin. Well, conclusion. Our examination of the doctrine of the resurrection of the body and the treatment of this doctrine by full preterists has demonstrated a number of serious errors in the hyper-preterist system. First, <clears throat> there is the problem of full preterist hermeneutics or biblical interpretation. They come to every passage about the second coming and resurrection with a presupposition which is contrary to the explicit teaching of Scripture that everything took place in A.D. 60-60-70 with the destruction of Israel. This assumption forces them to treat every single passage on the eschatological resurrection of the body in the, in the entire Bible as metaphorical or apocalyptic. This methodology has forced them to repeatedly follow a number of erroneous procedures. Number one, they often ignore the plain intent of the author. For example, 1 Thessalonians 4.13-18 Paul's comforting of believers who have dead loved ones, physically dead. No one can argue that Paul is not talking about physically dead believers. According to the full preterist, Paul's talking about a spiritual experience. Well, what does, good does that do somebody who's already dead in their souls in heaven? 
the proper, sanctified treatment of our physical bodies. 1 Corinthians 6, 13-18. Paul's arguing about, look, don't unite your physical body with a prostitute because your physical body will be resurrected. The nature of our resurrected physical bodies, 1 Corinthians 30, uh, 15, 35 and following, etc. Number two, they ignore or redefine the plain meaning of words without any exegetical justification in the immediate context. For example, graves, mortal body, descend, Air, those who sleep, the dead in Christ, raised incorruptible, changed, transformed. <clears throat> they either ignore what it means, or they take the passage in another place where it's used metaphorically or spiritual, spiritually, and then they oppose it on the passage in question where it is clearly not meant to be taken metaphorically. Passages that are didactic and non-metaphorical are treated as difficult and esoteric. This may explain why their literature ignores the very large body of Orthodox Christian scholarship, study, and exposition on the passages in question. My wife downloaded a whole bunch of articles on the rapture and different things on the internet from Phil Preterist websites. You will not see any quotations, unless they're quoting them to refute them, of any of the good, solid, exegetical uh, commentaries. Charles Hodge. Anybody. Plummer. Hendrickson. Are we to believe that of all the scholars, pastors and Christians, from the church fathers in the first century to the 19th century, not even one saw the truth on eschatology? That's their position. That is essentially their position. And I challenge every full preterist to produce five Christian authors prior to the 19th century who believe that the second coming of Christ happened in AD 70. I don't think you can produce one scholar, let alone five. Number three. <clears throat> when the plain teaching of the passage contradicts their theology, they use an unrelated passage to explain it away. For example, Matthew 24 is superimposed on 1 Thessalonians 4.13-18 to 18, and thus the fact that it's discussing a literal resurrection, a literal descent of Christ, and a literal meeting of the saints in the air is ignored or explained away. Okay, once again, I debated a full preterist a few months back. He was very effective. He ignored the meaning of 1 Thessalonians and talked about Matthew 24. I was not discussing Matthew 24, I was discussing 1 Thessalonians. Bait and switch. Number four. They are very adept at finding a specific meaning of a word, for example, body or air, etc., in a context that agrees with their eschatology and then arbitrarily applying it in context where it is obviously inappropriate. For example, in 1 Corinthians 6.13 and following the word body, which clearly refers to the physical body, 1 Corinthians 6, 15, 16, and 18, is said to be the body of sin, or the sinful nature, or Israel as a corporate body. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, the word air is said to be in man's spirit, or in the spirit realm, because Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2, 2. Now why would dead Christians, who are already in Christ's presence in heaven, go to meet him, in a spiritual realm. Do you understand how stupid that is? How ridiculous that is? Once again, when you debate a full preterist, they don't talk about the passage. They equivocate. Full preterists essentially deny the perpetuity of Scripture. Although there are some things in the Bible that are different, excuse me, that are difficult to understand, the things that we need to comprehend for salvation and biblical living are so plainly revealed that any Christian can easily grasp them. That's the doctrine of the perpetuity of Scripture. The Scriptures which describe the resurrection of the body are straightforward didactic passages. That is why the Church of Jesus Christ has always, always, always agreed to the bodily resurrection of believers. From the Apostles' Creed to the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Second Helvetic, 
The church has always agreed about the resurrection of the body as being literal. It is only when the full preterist takes hold of these passages that we learn that they are exceptionally difficult, metaphorical, and esoteric. Perhaps this is why the full preterists have been so have so many difficult view, uh, different viewpoints among themselves about the events surrounding the second coming of Christ. If you go to their websites and read their articles, they disagree about the rapture, and they disagree about a number of issues because it's a new system. It's like a cult; they're making it up as they go along. <clears throat> they spent far more time ex- attempting to explain away the meaning of passages than actually actually exegeting them. And they are like those of whom Peter spoke, who twist the scriptures to their own destruction. 2 Peter 3.16 Second, the most serious problem with full preterism is that its denial of a bodily resurrection results in a redefinition of the fall and a rejection of the gospel itself. Because salvation from physical death or the redemption of the physical bodies of believers obviously did not take place in A.D. 70. Full preterists are forced to accept physical death in the animal realm and even among human beings prior to the fall as perfectly normal. And this results in two radical heresies. Number one, death, suffering, bloodshed, disease, and evil are attributed to a direct creative act of God. Jehovah becomes the responsible agent of pain, suffering, death, and evil instead of man. The earth is dangerous and evil outside of Eden because God made it that way and in their worldview always intended it to be that way. This, beloved, is heresy. This is a radical departure of the biblical view of God. God is not the author or responsible agent of evil in the universe. Man is. God does not tempt man to sin, nor is man responsible for evil. Excuse me, nor is God responsible for evil. Man is. Number two. <clears throat> because hyper-preterists or full-preterists accept physical death as purely good, normal, or natural, and not something that is a consequence of the fall, they are forced by their worldview or paradigm to redefine the death and resurrection of Christ as something far less than what they really are. Although a full preterist could say that Jesus experienced spiritual death for his people on the cross, they cannot say that he died physically for our sins without contradicting their own system. They are left to argue that he died so his soul could visit the saints in Hades and tell them of their release, or so that he could rise only as a sign to the Jews. The vicarious atonement is denied. Now in this debate... And I didn't do very good in the debate. I'm not a very good debater. And I debated somebody who's debated the issue probably 150, 200 times. That was my first debate. I asked him, why did Jesus Christ, if, if death is natural, if death is part of God's created universe prior to the fall, why then did Jesus Christ have to die physically on the cross? And his answer was, he had to die so that he could rise from the dead as a sign to the Jews. Now, it is true that his death death and resurrection was a sign to the Jews. That is true. But if you study the whole Old Testament, the Proto-Evangelium, the prophets, the sacrifices, the temple, the New Testament, Christ died as a sacrificial death to satisfy divine justice against sin. The saving nature of Jesus' death is denied by the full preterist system. The biblical teaching that without the shedding of blood there is no remission is denied. Hebrews 9.22 The central core of the gospel that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15.3, Galatians 3.13, Romans 5.6-10, does not fit into their system. Now, you'll meet full preterists who say, yes, I believe Jesus died for your sins. However, they're inconsistent with their own system. They must reject the atonement or admit that physical death is part of the penalty for sin. It is for this reason that full preterism cannot be considered as a part of Christendom or evangelicalism. It must be classified as an eschatological cult. You say that's harsh and unloving. Well, 
I'm going to tell it to you straight. They deny the gospel. And there are heretics. And for anybody to water that down, we're not doing full preterist a favor, and we're not doing the people that they deceive a favor by watering it down. They deny the atoning sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, and they are heretics. Moreover, because full preterists believe that death is natural and physical bodies do not rise, they radically redefine and re distort the resurrection of Christ. <coughs> this should be expected. Because Paul warned the Corinthians that if physically dead men do not arise, then logically Jesus did not arise. 1 Corinthians 15.13 They do not explicitly deny the bodily resurrection of Christ. They do, however, radically redefine it and distort it. Now remember, beloved, Satan is not an idiot. Satan does not just simply come up with some stupid heresy his methodology is to use biblical terminology but redefine the terms. He did that with modernism and he does that with the heresy of full preterism. Full preterists do not believe that Christ rose with a glorified body. They teach that he arose with a regular, unchanged human body and that after it was used as a sign to the Jews, it was discarded. Some will say it's in a museum in heaven. I'm serious. I'm serious. I read this on their websites. Now, why would they teach this? Well, because if our Lord rose with a glorified, incorruptible spiritual body, he would imply the salvation of all Christians' physical bodies, which is exactly what the New Testament teaches. They use the first fruits ideology to teach that all believers receive completely new and different spiritual bodies. They believe that all Christian physical bodies will rot in the earth forever. They are never, ever redeemed. Consequently, they are forced by their system, by their paradigm, to reject the saving efficacy of Christ's resurrection for believers. Do you understand that? His resurrected glorified body is not really a first fruits at all, according to their system, as biblically defined. You have to learn not to be fooled by people using scriptural terminology when they take these scriptural terms and they completely redefine them away. According to them, his resurrected glorified body is not really a first fruits at all. Indeed, the full preterist view of the human body has more in common with Gnosticism or Neoplatonism than biblical Christianity because they teach that our physical bodies as created by God are defective. <coughs> Did you hear me? They teach that your physical bodies, as created by God, even before the fall, they're defective. They're defective. They are perishable. They are corruptible. They are liable to sickness, disease, and death. And they were always designed to be permanently disposed of like a bag of trash. And they even teach that if Jesus had not been crucified, that Jesus would have died of old age just like everyone else. Thus, full preterist, just like modernists, deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ by redefinition. If you go to a modernist, a flaming modernist, a flaming Christian literal, liberal who denies biblical inerrancy, and you ask them to their face, do you believe in the resurrection of Christ? They'll say, yes, I do. And then if they're honest with you and you take them out to lunch and you talk to them and you ask them about it, of course I wouldn't take them out to lunch because I wouldn't sit with a heretic, but if you talk to them and you ask them, they'll tell you, oh, well the resurrection of Christ is a metaphor for this and that. If you redefine it so it doesn't mean what Scripture says it means, you, you do not believe in the resurrection. And then number three. Because the full preterists use suffering, death, and evil as a normal part of God's created order, and views the second coming, the resurrection and final judgment as occurring in AD 70. They teach that the suffering, death, and evil in this world will never, never, ever come to an end. In other words, the ultimate victory of the cross and the empty tomb are redefined and consequently denied. The Bible explicitly teaches that every enemy of God will be subdued by the theanthropic mediator until even death itself is conquered. 
1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57, and Romans 4, Revelation 21, 4. The hyper-preterist, the full preterist, has reduced the efficacy of Jesus' redemptive work to the point that Satan's victory over Adam in the garden is made eternal. They teach that the work of Christ will leave this world in a... Listen to this. They teach that the work of Christ will leave this world in a far worse condition forever than it was before the fall. Their doctrine makes a mockery of God's character, the power of the cross, and the kingship of Christ. Now, there are some very tolerant, partial preterists who argue. And that's the spirit of our age. The spirit of our age is not to be like Luther and Calvin and to rebuke heresy, but to rather compromise with it. There are some very tolerant partial preterists who argue that full preterists should be accepted into the church as genuine believers. And by the way, I know of full preterists who are members in good standing in OPC and PCA churches. Yes, that's true. With some non-fundamental errors, because there, there were some professing Christians at Corinth who denied the resurrection of the body, and they were not immediately excommunicated. Well, this argument suffers from a number of serious problems, and this was, of course, brought up to me on an email from somebody who listened to the debate. First, people who are members of a church are not simply kicked out without being given an opportunity to repent. <clears throat> if those who denied the resurrection rejected Paul's corrective teaching in 1 Corinthians and were obstinate in their false doctrine, they most certainly would have been dealt with in due time. Isn't that correct? Even adulterers we give an opportunity to repent. Second, such an argument would prove too much because Paul has a whole section in chapter 6 where he deals with church members who were having sex with prostitutes. Does this reality mean that churches should tolerate habitual whoremongers or member, church members who spend and serve them the Lord's Supper? People who are sleeping with prostitutes on a regular basis? Obviously, like those who denied the resurrection, they would also have been dealt with if they refused to repent. Third, Paul's first and foremost argument against those who denied the resurrection of the body is that it logically destroys a central feature of the gospel itself, the resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 13-19. And we just dealt with that. Clearly, Paul himself, writing by divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, regarded a denial of the literal resurrection of believers, physical bodies from the dead, as destructive of the Christian faith. So if you have a beef with what I'm saying, don't take it up with me. You can take it up with the Apostle Paul. Given the Apostle's argumentation, <clears throat> it's 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. The, full, the full preterist teaching that God is the direct cause of death, suffering, and evil in this world, and the full preterist explicit denial that Jesus saves our bodies and this fallen world, they must be treated as damnable heretics. <clears throat> they must be. Paul, writing by the inspiration, says that if you deny the resurrection of the body, you deny the resurrection of Christ. And yes, they do deny the efficacy and the full meaning of Christ's resurrection. Such of you may be regarded as unloving, intolerant, and even unchristian in our pluralistic culture where church discipline is almost non-existent but we are thoroughly convinced it is the biblical position, and we will not retreat one iota from this position. Now I have an excursus here on the full preterist attempts to justify physical death before the fall, but I'm just going to wait and treat that another day because it's very, very long. Now you say, well, why spend so much time treating full preterism? Well, A, it's going to sharpen your understanding of the resurrection of the body, which is a crucial doctrine. B, believe it or not, full preterism has made many, many inroads into the Reformed community, and it's very popular. And I personally know three individuals who are Orthodox Reformed Christians who now are full preterist heretics. I know three separate individuals who have been seduced by this heresy. So it's very important that Reformed people indoctrinate themselves and inoculate themselves against this heresy. It destroys Christianity, Biblical Christianity. It destroys the Church. It is no better than a cult. 
Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for your word. We ask, Lord, that you will overthrow this damnable heresy. That the men, such as Don Preston, who are teaching this doctrine, that you would cause them to repent and to recognize the resurrection of the body and to recognize the true meaning of the gospel. And if you do not cause them to repent, Lord, we ask that you would strike them in your hot displeasure and wrath for perverting the word of God and destroying the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.